I mean, I guess like uh, from my perspective, I uh, I'd like to just be in the second cycle. That sounds pretty cool. Just, you know, rebelling, chilling out, have a good time. <laughs> that's, a, that's just a sad that you know, born in the wrong time, I guess. But and also, I suppose uh, I don't know for preparation for the next potential war. So I think like the the least effective places uh, in World War Two probably like South America potentially, right? Like generally unaffected. So I'm gonna head over to South America. Get some of my own land, uh, get loads of Bitcoin, and just chill out, have a good time. That's the. <laughs> no, I know it's not that simple, but uh, I guess. Uh, well, I, I, I want to keep going on this on this kind of conversation topic, but then I'm also uh, keen to ask you about something a little bit different, since we've probably not got too long left um, until we need to finish up. But I guess um, the, what I wanted to ask you about was was like the Swan Bitcoin situation. Um, so. A few questions, which I'll kind of ask you in, in a mishmash. Um, how, how, I guess, like, how did that, how did that happen? How did you end up doing that? <laughs> um, and I guess why as well, like, what was the opportunity that, that came to you? And then I suppose as well, like, to understand, like, Swan Bitcoin, one thing I wanted to ask you, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll save this next question. Just tell me the answer to those first ones. Uh, I, I think, yeah, it's probably best to go. Yeah, so Genesis there is, I met Corey, the CEO of Swan in, in my, sorry, in San Francisco in 2019. Yeah, Bitcoin 2019, San Francisco, in like June or something. We had a quick chat, um, formed a quick relationship. He told me about a company he's going to launch called Give Bitcoin, which was the original uh, implementation of this product. And then a few months later, I was out in LA, Corey, I said, hey, Bitcoiners, I'm in LA, who wants to meet up? Corey reached out, we got lunch, and he he sort of learned about my marketing experience and said, hey, will you help us set up an email marketing system for this product? Great. Um, help him do that. That turned into, okay, well, maybe you should do this for your job now. And that's just sort of, you know, partnership is obvious at that point, and it turned into a job. Um, so that's how it started. Um, why did we start SWAT? So... The key here is that we wanted a Bitcoin only exchange. We wanted to focus on uh, automatic recurring purchases, right? Your $50 a week, your 10 bucks a day, your a thousand a month, whatever your thing is. We want to build a product that's like that because there wasn't anything out there. And so we want to build a simple Bitcoin product. And the thesis was around education because our belief is that the more you know, the more you buy. Bitcoin. Pretty simple, pretty obvious. And so we're all in on education and community and trying to teach people pretty hardcore Bitcoin things that you're not going to get from a Coinbase or a Gemini uh, or even a Cash App, right? And so, and not, not that I'm against Cash App or I'm friendly, I support Cash App, but um, I think we have a better product, our fees half as much, and we're all in on Bitcoin and they're a little more distributed. So that's how we got there. Um, it's grown really fast. Um, thankfully, the Bitcoiners have supported it. And now we kind of have two primary uh, buckets in our business. We have the retail business, which is normal people buying Bitcoin. And then we have Swan Private, which is for high net worth individuals and or people who want to buy through a business entity. Maybe your company wants to put some of your treasury in Bitcoin. Maybe you have a trust. Maybe you have a IRA or some other tax advantage account and you want to move some Bitcoin there uh, or you just want to buy a million dollars to Bitcoin or whatever, whatever the number is. And so that's kind of like concierge. You get an account rep, you get all these fancy services. Um, so that's the two sides of business. Um, yeah. Maybe you had another question there. We'll stop. No, I mean like the, the follow-up question, I suppose uh, you explained like um, kind of the why and how you found yourself there, which I, I was interested in. Um, and, and I guess like the, the opportunity that like, the, the, the swan team saw right to, to come out come out with this this idea and implementation um i suppose the other thing was like hey when it comes to what you guys are up to now like are you guys just us based now or have you expanded further because I, I i i wasn't entirely certain i know you're not in the uk or at least if you are please tell me <laughs> but um I, I don't think you are um so like how's that kind of side of things going yeah, totally. So we initially launched in the US and I would say that's still probably like 90% of our business or something like that. Um, I could be wrong, but I think it's roughly around there. Um, we do have international customers from 50 countries maybe at this point, but what we don't have is a, so, okay, here's the deal. Banking systems in the US don't speak very nicely to banking systems somewhere else. You might have SEPA or you might have insert banking system. 
And so what we do for international clients is we only accept wire transfers. And wire transfers, are they speak the same language abroad, so it's easy to accept. And so if you're in the UK, you can wire us funds. It will clear same day or next day, and then you can do whatever you want with the funds once they're in your SWAN account. And so it's primarily larger customers who do wires. Like if you're buying 50 bucks a week, you wouldn't want to spend 10, 20 bucks on a wire transfer every week. Right. But if you sold the business and you want to move 10,000, 100,000, 100 million over, that makes sense internationally. Um, people ask, will you offer a DCA product in Europe or Canada in the future? Um, we want to say yes, but there's so much opportunity in the United States that it doesn't seem likely, for sure not this year. I'd be shocked if we did this year. Um, probably not even next year, to be honest. But if Corey is listening, he might have a different perspective. So don't don't hold me to that. <laughs> I, I I listen to you and just hold. No, I really appreciate everything you said. You know, it's a bit abstract, but you know, I've, this is the first time I've had. You know, I've been actually had an interview where you know you unpacked a lot and sort of had you know totally different you know perspective on you know Bitcoin and you know how it you know relates to human beings you know, in a special kind of way. I, you spoke about, you know, Bitcoin anti, you know, fragility. And, um, and one of the things that makes, uh, that makes or could make Bitcoin, you know, more anti-fragile is privacy, you know, privacy in the sense that, you know, especially at the base layer. And I think that, you know, privacy at the base layer is, is going to be, you know, a bond of contention in the future where, you know, we'd have people who think that, you know, Adding, you know, uh, privacy at the base layer, you know, might not sit down well with a bunch of people, especially the people in suits, like the micro sellers of the industry who would want, you know, Bitcoin adoption at the more corporate level. So, and I tend to agree with that, you know, perspective. Do you think um, Bitcoin privacy at the base, base, base la uh, layer could um, affect the adoption of Bitcoin or to, to limit Bitcoin, the potentials in terms of adoption um, and on a global scale. And, and do you think if, it, if, if that's the case, do you think it's, uh, it's a compromise that we could make? Or do you think, because I, don't, I do not see Bitcoin replacing the you know, fiat system as the, the way it is currently without you know, some sort of compromise, because I do not see government, you know, in accepting Bitcoin being totally private, like a Monero, or you know, on the same way that liquid, you know, liquid transaction, might having um, liquid, you know, um, liquid network as it is on the base layer, I don't think government was, you know, would accept that. So, do you think that it's a, it's a compromise that we could make to see Bitcoin, you know, as it is, you know, hard money, have all that, you know, core properties that it should that it has currently, but without privacy. Yeah, good question, Jerry. Couple things here. So. Um... I think that Bitcoin's base layer privacy is probably the weakest thing here. I think when you look out in the world of critics, Bitcoin critics, um, there's almost no good Bitcoin critics left. They, once you learn enough about Bitcoin in order to critique it, you end up just adopting the system because it makes way more sense. However, the good critics that are left, I would say are the Monero folks, even though they're extremely annoying on Twitter. Uh, they have a point, which is that Bitcoin privacy sucks, and it does um, on the base layer. But I think that it's not a question in a vacuum. Like, what, if we could make Bitcoin privacy better without trading off anything, of course we would say yes to that. But the reality is, um, I think that the community consensus, and I agree with this, is that the sanctity of the supply, so the ability to guarantee the supply cap has not changed, that is far more important than being able to hide transactions on the base layer. And so, I think that the setup that we have now is the best setup that we can have given the trade-offs in front of us. What I do hope is we invest a lot on layer two, um, side chains, layer three, layer four, five, six, whatever Bitcoin's going to turn into in layers. I do hope that we reclaim privacy on those layers. Um, and so that's how I would see that. Now, tying to your point about like, would a government accept it if it was not private? Or like, what about the Michael Saylors of the world? Or what about these like powerful entities and how do we approach that as a risk? Um, I agree. I think that the, the US government and other governments who are meddling in these systems, I think that they prefer the ability to spy on the chain. 
And that gives them some hope that they might be able to co-op the system in the future, or at least we're not gonna escape without paying their taxes, right? They're gonna get their pound of flesh. Um, and I think that that's right. And I think that um, it's kind of a Trojan horse for Bitcoin because it seems like, uh, it's not as scary as saying this like internet cash that nobody can, can spy on, right? And you're seeing a pushback right now with stable coins. Why? Because stable coins directly compete with US dollar uh, rails, which are spied on now. And stable coins are harder to spy on, just like the euro dollar market or offshore dollars or whatever. And I'd love to bring up an analogy here to wrap up, which is um, there is a Native American tribe called the Apaches. Um, they were in the Southwest of the United States. And as um, you know, US colony, uh, colonies started to move West, we sadly genocided the native population all around the continent. And the Apaches were the hardest to stop. Why is that? Because the Apaches form a decentralized hierarchy. They can freely decide which leader they want to go with. Like maybe I want to go with Ricardo and then maybe I think Ricardo is weak. So I go with Jerry and then the group splits or whatever. Right. So the U S would come in there, they would kill the leader and say, you know, do as we say, and the group would just fracture into two groups. You go kill those two leaders, now you have four groups, right? So they have a decentralized system. They have a protocol that decides where to go. It's kind of like individual nodes choosing which consensus rules to follow, if you want to compare it to Bitcoin. And it, it took like 100 years, if I'm getting my history right, to stop this Apache group. And what ultimately brought the group down uh, in, in an ingenious, diabolical way was they decided to give the leader, hey, here's a hundred cows or a hundred buffalo. In other words, give them wealth. And then they said, leader, now it's your job to distribute this wealth however you see fit to your constituents. And that process of giving them wealth is what broke down the Apache, um, turned into a political structure. And it was, you know, how do you figure out who is where? You got to form a committee to give out the buffalo. And the whole system broke, the culture broke. And I say this as a cautionary tale to the fact that we should not allow uh, number go up or Michael Saylor or insert any um, short-term risk that we might see of concentrating supply inside exchanges or getting in bed with Wall Street or governments or whatever. Essentially, we can't sacrifice our core principles in order to get adoption in the short term because we will crumble just like the Apache. Instead, we have to be rigid with principles, even if that comes at a high cost. And so, yeah, I just want to frame that up as a cautionary tale to um, think about this next stage, because I think Bitcoin is now uh, playing bigger and bigger battles with more important bosses. And so the stakes are getting increasingly high and we need to stay vigilant. I just got a clap. I love the analogy with the Apaches. It's totally, man, well done. Yeah, Thank you, Jerry. That. Good question, man. That's a good answer for sure, man. I, I, I think there's like a... I think there's definitely two podcasts worth of stuff in here. Like if we can, if we can have you back in the, in the future, that'd be appreciated. Um, Cause I'd like to keep going. I'd love to. I'm, I'm mumbling a little bit cause it's late here, but I, uh, yeah, I definitely would uh, definitely love to have you back. I, um, yeah, I guess, well, yeah, we'll, we'll wrap it up uh, cause of the time, but yeah, thank you so much, man, for, uh, for taking the time out of your day to come on and, and talk with us three delinquents. It was, uh, it was awesome. And it was good to, to get like a different perspective as well. Like uh, the whole mycelium Bitcoin like link is something that uh, I'd seen that you'd written on and I'd like sk skimmed bits, but I hadn't really properly. And then as you said, you explained it pretty much perfectly. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for the time. I, I really appreciate it. And uh Thank you to everyone out there listening as well, uh, who's listening to all of us. It's much appreciated. Hope all of you uh, have an amazing day, week, year, life, whatever it is. Uh, and remember to buy Bitcoin.